Let's give a round of applause for Carol Pope. Well, this is the artist talk question and answer period. I am joined by Bernie Bancroft. Hello. I think a lot of you might know who that is. And of course, Carol Pope. Thanks for coming. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> We're not going to grill you that hard. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. Do, you Do want I me? get to go first? I think, yeah. yeah ladies, well, first. ladies first. Ladies first, wonderful. First. Well, I, I really, I want to talk about um, Lesbians in the Forest. Okay. <laughs> so that song, you played it on Transparent. As you said, we saw you briefly. And did My head. You, you wrote that before the show. Yeah. And how did that come about? How did it end up being on the show? Well, um, I was hanging out with my friend Kate Rigg working on a musical that I'm working on. I thought I'd throw that in there. And um, I get a phone call from The Peach, um, and she's like, what are you doing? Are you in town? Are you going to be here for the next week? And I'm like, yeah. And she said, do you want to be on Transparent? And, uh, and then she said that she pitched the song to Jill Soloway, because Peaches wrote the rap part in the middle, which you didn't hear tonight. Um, and um, I'm like, yes, I love that show. So we ended up, you know, be, they, it was like they were recreating kind of the Michigan Women's Festival. And it was like 150 degrees that day. And we were in a, in a forest somewhere near Tarzana. Um, and they were, you know, there's like naked chicks and S&M. And uh, there was, it was, they did an amazing job of recreating the Michigan Women's Festival without calling it that. Um, and um, yeah, we just did the song and it was like just a great experience. And I got to talk to meet Jill Soloway for a minute. And I actually was talking to Eileen Miles and I didn't even realize it. And I'm like, oh my God, after, <laughs> after the fact. Um, had, you ever, had you ever played at the Michigan Women's Festival? Yes, that's where I wrote the song because I was mocking it. Because <laughs> I said, because <laughs> when we were there, uh, this is all crap that's in my book. Um, I was seeing somebody and she dumped me and, but she got me, she was like a comic, and she got me a gig at the festival, so I went to the festival, and she was there with the new chick, and then I got hit on by this like total hot babe. Um, and, uh, but it was, it's an amazing experience because there are no men, except for the men who, you know, empty the johns, that's for real, <laughs> the shit men. Um, <laughs> But it's like, it was so freeing to just be with all these women and there were children and um, it, it's an amazing experience. And then sadly it got all political um, and they had to shut it down. So that's, that's really sad. Uh, but they didn't ask me back because I said something <laughs> inappropriate when I was performing because that's my job. <laughs> I was making a joke, but they didn't get it because lesbians, as I don't think lesbians have much of a sense of humor. Some, some do. And that's why I ended up recording this EP, my latest EP, Music for Lesbians, just because all the songs mock lesbians, and that's all I wanted to do. Well, yeah, and the song also from that EP, um, Vagina Wolf, yeah. which has an amazing video. Who directed that video? Um, actually, a porn friend of mine. <laughs> it has that flavor, actually. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Well, actually, um, a friend of mine uh, did a film called... Um, she gave me all these clips called... Uh, who's afraid of vagina wolf. So she gave me a lot of clips. And then, which is a really, you guys should check that movie out. It's, it really is based on Virginia Woolf. Um, so she gave me the whole movie. And then this guy, friend of mine who just does porn, <laughs> directed the, you know, the part of me singing. But all he does is like, I mean, sometimes I'm on Twitter and I'm like, how can I be seeing this shit on Twitter? It's like full on man sex. But that's, all, that's his whole job. He just goes to Palm Springs every other weekend and directs porn. And so that's the video. That's how that happened. And that, that does, so the dancing vaginas was from the movie. Yeah, that's from the movie. Um, that's not him. Just to be clear. He just, clear. He just knows about dancing penises. <laughs> Carol, in this late 70s, early 80s, rough trade, general idea, Canada seemed to have this real grasp on cool queer culture. What were your fondest sort of memories of that era? Um, I think, well, general idea, I th we, were, we were playing in a place called Grossman's Tavern, and 
we played there a lot and offended a lot of people. <laughs> and everybody in the world came to see us. And they walked in one day and were like, what, what is that? Because they just looked bizarre. Because it was, I don't know if you know these guys, A.A. A. Jorge and uh, Felix, those were their art names. Um, they just had like, you know, colored hair and they brought all these other characters showed up like Flaky Rosehip and Donna Dogmatic, like all these art people showed up. Um, and we ended up doing uh, performance art with them and they ended up doing, uh, how many of our album covers? One, two, three, four of our album covers. Um, and uh, helping create our image. But that whole, every, the whole scene was just one big scene then. Like we, everybody was supportive of, people in bands and people in theater and people in film. Um, I don't think it's like that now. It was just like an amazing time to be in Toronto and you know, we'd all go to New York, we'd hang out in New York and uh, I didn't go to London but there was a whole London scene and also here because we, pl we would play here a lot too. Um, some b place where the bar, the stage was on top of a bar, I remember. Um, um, but anyway, it was just an amazing time to, to be there and know these people and be encouraged by them and and be supportive. You know, it was just, um, I already said amazing, but you know what I mean, <laughs> it was a great time. You were out loud and proud in the late 70s, early 80s before it was on Vogue. Did you realize how groundbreaking you were at the time and, and what you were doing or was it just sort of free flow, this is Carol Pope and your creativity? Um, it, I was just like, I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, just like make out with babes in public places and and um, do whatever uh, because to me sexuality I mean especially in North America it's still so fucked up and people are so weird about it and I'm like uh, um, you know there was just I just felt very free to do that to just be with women and to wear a bondage suit and whip people in the audience and whatever, and people really gravitated towards that because nobody else was doing that, you know. Well, before Michael Jackson and Madonna, you were the first pop star to grab your crotch. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> was it deliberate? Was it just like, just go for it? What? Um, I, I, we wrote this song called Autoerotic Love, so I was like masturbating on, pretend, I was like so, so tame. Just compared. It was just for stage. Yeah, so tame compared to today. Um, so I was just feeling myself up on stage, and then that's how the crotch grab came, and then I threw it, threw it into High School Confidential, which uh, I guess we wrote, we wrote that for a movie called Cruising, actually. Um, so that's how that came about, but I'm, you know, but I, I swear, I had this giant bullwhip and a riding crop, and I would just go to town on everybody, and, <laughs> <laughs> and on myself. <laughs> and, and, oh, and what was really funny was the cops would come, and like, you know, they were like looking to bust us. And I'm like, why are you looking at me like playing with myself when down the street the vile tones are somebody are playing and they're like, everybody's beating everybody up and they're cutting themselves on stage and blood's all over the place. So why are you like checking me out? Go check that shit out. You mentioned cruising. And yeah. you guys had a few songs, Rough Trade had a few songs yeah. on the soundtrack. How did that all come to be? Um, I don't know exactly. William Friedkin, the director... Uh, and Jack Nietzsche, who did the late great Jack Nietzsche, who did the music, they somehow knew about us because we did play in New York a lot, so we had a little cult following there. So somebody phoned me in from Freakin's office, and they said, "Do you want to come and take a look at this movie? Because uh, we'd like you to write some songs." And um, I went, and I was like, "Oh," because it was like you know, it's about a gay serial killer. There's all this gay sex, Al Pacino is like playing a gay undercover, I'm uh, playing an undercover. Uh, an undercover gay. An undercover gay, Who sorry. Gets carried <laughs> away. Yeah, he gets carried away, he gets swept up in the life. He's like, I'm gonna fake pretend I like this and then I'm liking this. <laughs> I'm, I'm digging this. And um, That's what happens. And there was just a lot of gruesome, they cut a lot of it, because it was like pretty grisly, like the murders, the murder scenes. Um, so that's Did you get to see the original cut before they took that out? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was looking at. I was like, oh, but I want to work with William Friedkin and I want to work with Jack Nietzsche because, you know, he did 
uh, The Shining. He worked with the Rolling. He arranged stuff for the Rolling Stones. Uh, he worked with Phil Spector. I'm like, are we going to say no to Jack Nietzsche? And um, anyway, but I did like the idea of a gay serial killer. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So we just went for it, and it was it was great. He was such a character. Um, there was a, all this scandal going on because Jack Nietzsche was married to this actress Carrie Snodgrass, and he that was her real name. I, yeah, sadly. <laughs> um, and she, I forget what movies she, he, she was in, but um, she was accusing him of like raping her with a gun and all that. And and Mick Deville worked on the movie. Um, anyway, there was a lot of dr- there was like drugs and insanity and craziness going on, but it was but I'm glad I did it. Well, I know that James Franco and I forget the other artist did a recreation of the the deleted scenes, quote unquote, from that movie. Oh, that's yeah. And it would have been way more interesting if they would have included a rough trade song. <laughs> Just saying. I I want to see that. But you were saying they're releasing all the songs in an expanded album? They're suppo- it hasn't come out yet. It was supposed to come out at Christmas, but I don't know what's going on. I know you can get it on... Um, it's called it's Mondo Records, and all they do is release soundtracks, and I know there's a version on blue vinyl of the original, but they're supposed to release a three-album set of all the other songs we wrote, which kind of frightens me, and all the songs. There was a lot of great people on that soundtrack, like Mink Deville had a lot of songs, and The Germs, and I um, can't remember anybody else at the moment, but it's a really good soundtrack. Um, so I don't know what's going on with that. And you wrote High School Confidential for that soundtrack? Yeah, we did. We were like, oh, Mink Deville can sing this, and then it was like, no, and then <laughs> oh, we were really glad because... Uh, I mean, I I really did write it for a guy to sing, and then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to sing it. And did anyone try and talk you out of it? Like, did you have anyone at your label or anyone trying to convince you not to release it? Did it seem like a good idea for your career, or did it seem like career suicide? I didn't give... We didn't give a We were just like, whatever makes us happy. And it was such a... You know, we had been doing it live, and people loved it, so of course we had to put it out there. And then once we put it out there, radio tried to censor it. So, or, and they did. Some of them did. They bleeped out which line? They bleeped out the cream, uh, my, cream jeans. my jeans. <laughs> the whole I don't thing. Understand. Or just Why the would cream? They which was the offensive <laughs> part? <laughs> she uh, makes me bleep my, my jeans. My. <laughs> yeah, my. Um, I we actually Chum FM actually paid for us to go and re-record it, and um, a friend of mine, Marge Gross, just said, "Why don't you say order Chinese food?" So I I did. <laughs> I've sure. never heard that version. There's a version uh, she of makes it. me order Chinese food when she comes my way. <laughs> um, and then they just gave up on us because we really were like, oh, yeah. and I just made noises and then they just start bleeped it because we were so pissed off about the whole thing. It was like so stupid. Um, you worked with a very famous legendary drag queen, Divine. Yes. I don't know if a lot of people know, but that that's to me... Um, I have a drag history, so <laughs> I think it's major. Really? I, shh. Oh. What did, talk, talk about that. How did that all come to be, and what was it? Um, we were big fans of Divine because they used to show Divine movies at midnight at the Roxy in Toronto. And um, I don't know why we wanted to write a musical or <laughs> a big stage extravaganza, but we did. And we went, Kevin and I went to New York and saw Divine and Women Behind Bars, directed by Ron Lank. Um, Yeah, we went and saw Divine. We were like, oh my God, we love you. You know, Divine plays a prison matron. Um, (laughs) So we went backstage and met Divine and said, hey, do you want to be in this musical extravaganza that we're doing called Restless Underwear? (laughs) Um, And Divine had never sung before, which was really weird. So... Um, and his name is Glenn. Uh, so he said, yeah, okay. And then he came to Toronto. And um, for some reason, oh, there's this chick managing me for a minute um, who was friends with David Bowie's manager at the time. And he gave us like $10,000, I don't know why, <laughs> to put on this stupid show in Toronto at Massey Hall <laughs> um, called Restless Underwear. And my sister and I co-wrote it. My sister who like went on to write for Seinfeld and stuff like that later on. Um, so 
So we wrote this stupid thing. I had a lot of songs that had a, all the band was dressed like sailors. There was backup singers. There was a semi-naked guy on a dog leash. There was whipping. Divine and I did a couple of uh, little plays called drama moments. One was called Truck Stop Girl, and one was about um, Mama Cass choking on a ham sandwich and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, people loved it. We didn't even have a record deal then. Um, and I don't know why we never filmed it. Like, my brother shot, like... I was just going to ask, yeah. He shot, like, a little Super 8 of it, which I haven't posted yet, but I have to. Just a yes, little... you do. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, and then we did it in New York, and it was a disaster because half the audience knew who we were, and the other half was like, who the f*** are they? And, the, you know, and then people were there to see Divine. But we got to work with some crazy actors and things, and... It was just a great experience, and Divine was really charming, and he talked. He taught us how to like walk out on a bill in a restaurant, and because <laughs> I hadn't done that before. And um, takes a queen. And he, the other queen thing he did was we went. We were rehearsing at the CBC, and we went to the costume department, and he stole all this stuff. <laughs> he just rammed all this stuff in his jacket, all these clothing, all this uh, these outfits. <laughs> That's so funny. You mentioned David Bowie. You guys also toured with David Bowie. Yeah, we did, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, I can't even believe that he's gone. It's like so, so sad. So sad. Um, yeah, we just got asked to open for him. Um, the first gig that we did with him was at the CNE, I think. Or, no, where was it? Somewhere in Toronto. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we went out, we opened for him, and um, and he was on stage watching us, like, because he just wanted to check us out, and then he asked us to do some other dates. And I really only talked to him once when I was standing on stage, because he had this woman, Coco Schwab, who was like this tenacious assistant. I mean, she's really amazing, but she was just like, you couldn't get near him. Um, so he just came up to me and he knew that I'd been with Dusty Springfield, so he's like gossiping about that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, he, he said that I was great and we hugged it out. And, um, and Kevin and I mostly hung around with his band because um, Carlos Alomar, fantastic guitar player, and um, we just hung out with them all night and there was just parties like insane parties in hotel rooms with so many groupies. They had so many groupies that they had to go, come in in shifts. They would have like 50 people in the room and they would shove them out and 50 more people would come in. And then David would show up at like four in the morning or something. It was like exhausting. And, but it was fantastic. And then the tragic thing was that David wanted us to go to tour Australia and <clears throat> California with him and our stupid record company. CBS um, wouldn't give us tour support. So, uh, yeah. I hate them. I hate them so much. Oh I want to just stab them in the eye, balls. <laughs> Whoever they are. So you mentioned Dusty Springfield. Yeah. And maybe you want to tell us about your first date, which was... Which was here. In Montreal. Oh. In Montreal at the Ritz-Carlton. City Carl of the Love. Ritz -Carlton. It was at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> um, Fancy. But I actually met her, she did a show in New York, and um, she was two hours late going on, but in the audience was Rock Hudson, uh, Fran Lebowitz, Helen Reddy, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. <laughs> Who is that actress? What's that actress? Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour. <laughs> um, this other weird singer, really unattractive singer, Jane Oliver. <laughs> Who had like a song called Some Enchanted Evening? Does any gay know who I'm talking about? She was like, any gay, nobody knows. So I, I go back, I was like, went back to meet Dusty and Helen Reddy came back with Jane Oliver and then to say hi and then Dusty goes, she's a dyke. Oh. <laughs> um, Anyway, so that's when I met her, and then we had our first... Then we just talked on the phone forever and had our first date here in Montreal. And she was actually doing a benefit for this dude, a really rich, obnoxious dude. And we went to his house, and he had his own helicopter. And he had a painting by Monet or somebody, 
um, over the fireplace. But to make sure that we knew that, he had like a book uh, <laughs> open so you could see. Oh yeah, that painting's on the wall. Um, but yeah, good times. Sounds it. I mean, a lot of this is it's chronicled in your book, Anti Diva. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I, I was obviously so influenced by you, and there were so many other feminist-driven um, new wave acts. I mean, Martha and the Muffins, and so on. What other bands from that era in Canada did you sort of gravitate to and, and adore? Um, the Dishes, who we worked with. Um, the Diodes. Uh, I'm still friends with the lead singer, Paul Robinson, who lives in um, London, and his sister's a big les, and she, <laughs> we talk sometimes. She does, uh, she has a, what's her thing called? She has a blog, anyway. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, who else? And oh yeah, there was like crazy bands, like the B-Girls, and I'm, rec and, um, The B-Girls, yeah. And the curse who just wore tampons, like stained tampons all over their body. They Before were like, L7. Yeah, they okay. were just like pretty much naked and they were just wrapped in tampon and pads <laughs> with fake blood all over them. Um, that was nice. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm missing out on some bands, but the, those are the ones that come to mind. Well, you collaborated with a few uh, over the years. Did we? Well, um, never said I loved you. Oh, that was later on. Oh. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, I just sang this breeder song with Paul Hyde from the Paolis. And I'm like, why am I singing this? But I... <laughs> I love that song. I know. I've done like a couple of breeder things. I've like done two or three like total breeder things. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is so ridiculous. I'm singing like this love song with this idiot. <laughs> no, I mean, he's not an idiot. I love Paul Hyde. Oh, my God. <laughs> um... um yeah, that's why I did it, because I really love and respect Paul Hyde, and he's a Brit like I am. And um, uh, But yeah, it's a, 